Hello everyone and welcome to the weekly surgical series by Mind of Leap. Thank you very much for joining us and today we're going to talk about appendicitis, um, which is quite a common topic in um, one of the most common surgical emergencies. So if you, if you do work on a surgical ward, you're most likely are going to come across um, a patient with appendicitis. Um, so without further ado, um, I'm going to start the session, but just wanted to remind everyone that um, you can just post your questions in the chat at any time. I'm going to try to make the session a bit interactive, so I'm going to ask you questions as we go along. Um, and if you have any questions at any time, you can also contact us at the Mind the Bleep um, email, which we're going to post later. And if you want to have access to today's session, the recording, and all the materials, um, you'll have to fill in the feedback form, which we're going to post later. Um, so let's just move on to the session. So the key points that I'd like to um, touch on today is um, I'd like everyone to understand what the presentation of acute appendicitis is. Um, we're going to focus on key parts of the history and examination. Then we're going to talk about key surgical investigations. Um, and we're going to practice application of those skills during a case. So my name is Sara Yashanovska. I'm an academic FY2 doctor, and I currently work at Mary's doing vascular surgery. And my interests, apart from vascular surgery, include plastics and teaching and research. So the case for today, um, you have to bear in mind that you're going to be the surgical FY1 on take, and you're going to be clerking, um, clerking a patient. So the patient that um, comes through the door and you have to assess, her name is Rose. She's a 21 year old female. She has no past medical history. She presents with nausea and vomiting, which started this morning. She's unable to eat. Um, and the first symptom that she's noticed was that generalized abdominal pain, which started two days ago um, and now has moved to right iliac fossa. She also complains of some diarrhea and she feels hot and sweaty. Um, so I would like you to think about potential differentials. So what are some, um, some possible pathologies here? You can pop your answers in the, in the question box. Um, if you can just think about what could be, apart from the appendicitis, which is the topic of this conversation, um, if you could think about what other diseases or what other problems Rosie might have. And I'm going to try and look up the chat box. All right, we might have to do it this way. Apologies for that. Yeah, that's very good. Epitopic pregnancy, ovarian cyst, ovarian torsion. Yeah, that's all very good. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay, that is really good because it does show that everyone is thinking about not only um, gastrointestinal causes, but also about gynecological um, pathologies and also um, somebody said testicular torsion, interception, that is all very good. Um, so when you, when you have a patient who, who comes through the door with abdominal pain, you have to think about all the possible differentials because that's going to help you um, decide what investigations you're going to do and how you're going to manage the patient. So the way we're going to approach this case, um, we usually use the mnemonic sample when we're taking the history. Um, so we have to know what the signs and symptoms are. We need to know if the patient has any allergies, what medications they're taking. We need to know what the relevant past medical history is. Um, we want to know because they might need a surgery. When was the last time they had anything to eat? Um, but also for females, we want to know when the last um, when their last menstrual period was. 
um, we to examine the patient. Um, so we're going to do the AT examination for Rosie um, and we're going to do the investigations, um, which I'm going to go through in a second. But those are going to consist of bedside, bloods, radiology. Um, so moving to our differentials, um, you have identified them very correctly. So there is one way of looking at them is to group them into um, anatomical systems or, or body systems. Um, so the gastrointestinal causes, as you rightly said, um, could be the inflammatory bowel disease, Meckel's diverticulum, um, gastroenteritis, um, it could be testicular torsion if we're thinking about urological causes, epididymitis or UTI. Um, some gynecological pathologies um, could include ovarian cyst rupture, ectopic or um, pelvic inflammatory disease. So this is why it's very important, as we're going to touch on in a second, that for all females, we have to do a pregnancy test. Um, another cause could be mesenteric adenitis, and that's usually seen in children and usually is preceded by sore throat. Um, and usually the treatment is conservative, so it's quite an important, important differential. Acute appendicitis, um, as we're going to talk about in more detail, and a DKA is quite an important thing to bear in mind because appendicitis is most common in people um, in second to third decade of life, um, sometimes first to, to third decade of life, depending on, on the source. And it can present very similar to DKA. So this is why it's very important, as I'm going to touch on in a second, that we do the blood glucose level for the patients who come in um, complaining of abdominal pain and vomiting. So moving on. So acute appendicitis. Um, first of all, we, we're not really sure what the role of the appendix is. Um, it might have some, um, some functions that are related to the immune system, but um, reading through the literature, it's really difficult to identify what the role of appendix is. Um, it's um, attached to a cecum, and um, usually what happens in acute appendicitis is that it gets obstructed. Um, in younger patients, usually it's due to lymphoid hyperplasia, usually after um, a viral disease. And in older patients, it can be blocked by um, by heart stool, called a fecal uh, and very rarely a malignancy, so a tumor of um, affecting the cecum or the appendix. So the pathophysiology, um, once the appendix gets obstructed, the mucus secretion and normal secretions that usually happen in the appendix continue. The pressure increases because there is lots of secretions and the outlet is obstructed. Um, at the same time, the bacteria um, overgrows and that then results in edema, ischemia and necrosis. So it's quite important to um, treat those patients in a timely manner um, because when they present with a simple appendicitis, they can quite easily progress to, um, to complicated or perforated appendicitis. So the pain in appendicitis, um, I think majority of you would have heard um, about the migratory pain. So I just wanted to explain a little bit of um, what's the reasoning behind it and, and why the pain starts in the center of the abdomen and then moves. So the appendix is derived from the midgut um, in the embryo. And the midgut is, um, there are visceral afferent pain fibers, which are associated with structures derived from the midgut, which will, which will localize the pain to a T10 dermatome. Um, so when the visceral um, peritoneum gets irritated, those fibers um, will cause this generalized pain around the umbilicus, around the, the belly button. Um, but as the inflammation progresses, um, the outer layer, the parietal peritoneum of the appendix will get irritated as well. And that activates somatic nerve fibers, which are much better at discriminating where the structure which is inflamed and is causing the pain is located at, as opposed to the visceral afferent um, pain, fi pain fibers. 
So this then causes the migration of the pain from the center of the abdomen to the right iliac fossa. And the, there is also a change of the nature of the pain. So from a sort of a dull pain, it becomes sharp and localized in the right iliac fossa. So that uh, classically happens within 12 to 24 hours. And the patients usually describe this central abdominal pain, which then moves to right iliac fossa, changes the nature from dull to sharp and then it's associated with nausea and vomiting. So when the pain localizes to right iliac fossa, um, it migrates to the point which is called the McBurney's point. So it's just, uh, there is a little diagram for you to show where the, the McBurney's point is located. So it's two third of the way from the umbilicus to the anterior superior iliac spine. The patients who present with um, appendicitis, when we examine them, there are some specific signs that we can elicit, which will help the, the diagnosis. So the, the main signs that we are looking for um, are illustrated in here. So a STOA sign is characteristic um, for the retrocecal appendicitis. So it's the appendix in the re retrocecal, so behind the cecum position which by the way is the most common location of the appendix. Um, so this appendix behind the cecum is irritating the adjacent psoas major muscle. So when we're stretching, um, stretching the psoas major muscle by extending the leg, um, this will cause the patient a great deal of pain. Moving on, um, at the bottom, the obturator sign. Again, we can elicit um, pain and discomfort in the patient who has appendicitis by rotating a flexed thigh um, internally. And that again will um, cause irritation of the surrounding structures because of stretching the muscles. And there is a lot of inflammation and a lot of um, edema um, and that causes irritation of the surrounding structures. The Robson sign, um, that's elicited when we press or when we palpate the left iliac fossa, that causes increased, increased pressure in the entirety of the gut, and it will elicit the pain in the right iliac fossa. So even though the appendix, as um, I, hopefully everybody knows most of the time, is on the right-hand side, uh, palpating of the left side will cause the pain on the right um, because of this increased back pressure in the, in the gut caused by the palpation. And lastly, the McBurney sign um, is the pain that localized to the right iliac fossa. So the classical um, point where the pain in appendicitis is felt. So going back to our patient, um, we're going to do the ATE assessment. So the patient comes through the door, she's complaining of all the signs and symptoms that we have um, mentioned so far. Um, and we're going to do the ATE assessment on her. So the airway, she's maintaining um, by herself. She is breathing a little bit fast. Her respiratory rate is 23. Her oxygen saturations are 97%. Circulation, um, so her heart rate is 115, so it is raised. And the blood pressure is 90 over 65. Um, her GCS is 15 over 15, her pupils are normal. And we do notice that she does have a low grade fever and there is quite, quite a great deal of pain and um, peritonism in the right iliac fossa, um, which she describes as eight out of 10. And the SARS and Rotzing signs, the ones that we've mentioned just now, are positive. So this is the, um, the breakdown of the ATE assessment and abdominal examination in Rosie. But I just wanted to highlight in here that in male patients, it's really important to always examine external genitalia because as you rightly said in the comments, um, the abdominal pain and the patient feeling unwell in males could be caused by testicular torsion or epididymitis. And it's really important, um, it's really important to spot it as soon as possible as those patients with testicular torsion will need urgent intervention. So 
with the patient who presents with abdominal pain and vomiting, there are some red flags that we need to look out for. And it's very really important to, to spot them because those should trigger the immediate escalation. Um, so when you're clerking the patient, um, when you're examining, examining them and they have involuntary guarding, they're rigid and it's really difficult for them to move because it causes them a lot of pain. You should suspect that the patient, um, if you're suspecting appendicitis, you should suspect that it could have perforated or it's not just a straightforward simple appendicitis and there is a contamination of the entire abdomen and irritation to the peritoneum. And that's not a good sign. If the patient is in a lot of pain and looks very unwell, you should escalate this as soon as possible as well. And if the patient is hemodynamically unstable, um, we should escalate it as soon as possible as well. So with Rosie, um, she is tachycardic and her blood pressure is bit too low for us to be to be content with um, so in this case we will have to escalate to the senior as soon as possible and act on anything that we find in the ATE assessment so most likely we're going to start with giving her some IV fluid bolusis and we're going to escalate to a senior but um, assuming that we're waiting for a senior and we now have to order some investigations let's think about um, what investigation would be relevant in here. So if you could think about some bedside investigations, some bloods that will be relevant and some radiological tests that could be relevant in this scenario. And if you could please put them in the, in the chat section. Okay, so we've got the abdominal x-ray, ultrasound, okay, ECG black glucose, yeah, those are all very good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very good to be the HCG. Okay, I'll give you one more minute to think about anything else that's relevant in here. All right, perfect. Well, I hope that all this knowledge is coming from our previous sessions because you guys, um, you guys got it and it's, it's quite spot on. I'm just going to try to go through those investigations systematically. So going from bedside, moving to bloods and then radiology and try to justify why we're doing each of them. All right, so the bets investigations as majority, as yes, some people have mentioned in the answers, we're going to do an ECG as we do for every patient who comes through the door, especially for unwell patients. Um, and also Rosie is tachycardic, so we have to do the ECG. We're going to do a COVID test because most likely, um, most likely she's going to get admitted. So that's one of the reasons, but also um, because we know that COVID has some um, not the very classical presentation. So we're just going to do it to, because we're going to keep it on the list of our differentials. We're going to do the urine dip, um, urine pregnancy test and blood glucose. Now, the urine dip um, is important because it's going to help us um, rule out some of the um, pathologies. So if we're thinking about kidney stones as our differential, the patient is likely to have some blood um, on their urine dip. If we're thinking about UTI, then nitrates and leukocytes are going to be raised. Um, but in the patients with appendicitis, the leukocytes can still be slightly raised, especially if the appendix is lying on the top of the bladder. 
So that's quite important too, to keep it in mind. So if the leukocytes are just slightly raised, um, we shouldn't jump to the conclusion and think that's UTI, it can still be appendicitis. The urine pregnancy test, very important um, in females because that's going to change our management altogether if we think that it's the ectopic pregnancy causing the symptoms or is it regular pregnancy causing the symptoms. And also um, we need to know that because if um, we're thinking about giving the patient any medication, especially antibiotics, if we're thinking about doing any scans, we really do need to know if the patient is pregnant. Um, and the blood glucose is quite important because of two things. Um, so the patient could be hypoglycemic. So they might have low blood glucose because of the vomiting um, and because of the fact that they were unable to eat for a prolonged period of time of appendicitis, or they can have high blood glucose. So they can be hyperglycemic because they might be suffering from DKA. So again, that's important test to do because that will guide our management. It will help us to, to rule out some other important differentials. Moving on to bloods. So um, I think if you have attended previous webinars, um, you might begin to spot the, the theme. So for the surgical patients, um, the blood orders are pretty much the same every time we're dealing with a patient who presents with um, abdominal pain um, or any other um, surgical, general surgical presentation. Um, so we will need to do a full blood count. Um, in this patient, because we're suspecting that the white cells are going to be raised, um, we're going to do eusinies because the patient is vomiting um, and is nauseous, is not eating, and it might be dehydrated. So that can affect the electrolytes and the kidney function. We're going to do the liver function test as a baseline. And also because we're going to give the patient some antibiotics and that can affect their liver function. So it's an important test to, to do as a baseline. Um, we're going to do a CRP. Again, if raised, that can suggest um, inflammation or infection. We're going to do magnesium and a bone profile because again, the patient has been nauseous, has been vomiting, has not been eating. So we need to know um, what the magnesium and the bone profile is and it's important for baseline. We're going to do amylase because the patient with abdominal pain um, and the pain which is quite significant, um, we have to remember about um, pancreatitis. So um, amylase is going to be an adjunct in trying to rule out uh, pancreatitis um, because sometimes, again, the pain in appendicitis may be fully localized. Um, so it's an important test to do. And also be raised if there is a perforation of any, um, of any organ in the abdomen. And because we are thinking that the patient might need a surgery, we have to do some important preoperative bloods as um, so two of those would be group and safe and clotting. So this um, this set of bloods, I think you're going to, to get quite familiar with and that's going to be recurring during the sessions that we're going to do because this is a um, routine set that we do for essentially all surgical patients that come to the hospital. Um, so Rosie's results. Um, her urine dip shows one plus of leukocytes. But as I said before, that can be caused, um, that can be seen in appendicitis. So it's important to be aware of that. Her beta HCG test is negative. Um, so she is not pregnant. Her blood glucose is normal. Her hemoglobin is normal. White cells are quite significantly raised at 16.6, .6, as is the CRP at 70.2. Her amylase is 67, which is within a normal limit, and the eusinies and LFTs are normal. So again, we she does have symptoms which are suggestive of appendicitis. Of appendicitis. Her white cells and CRP um, are raised, which again is seen in appendicitis. Um, she has a fever, um, and her urine depth shows one class of leukocytes, which again can be used as an adjunct to, to diagnose appendicitis. So moving on to radiology, um, some of you said that we should do an abdominal x-ray. Some of you said we should do an ultrasound and some of you did mention the CT. So appendicitis is usually a clinical diagnosis. So in our patient, um, because 
as we did say, the bloods are um, the bloods are suggestive of appendicitis, and her symptoms are quite typical for appendicitis. Um, one could argue that she does not need um, any radiological investigations to um, to diagnose appendicitis. Um, but in females, um, the ultrasound is quite an important um, first line investigation because it helps us rule out um, other pathology, in particular gynecological pathology. And it does have a benefit of um, not involving ionizing radiation, um, which is really helpful in females and in children. Um, so it's um, within hours, it's quite a, a good test, but the, the issues are that it is operator dependent and on the weekends and out of hours, it's, uh, it's very difficult to, to do the ultrasound. So if, um, if the patient presents in hours, um, we're fairly uncertain uh, whether it's appendicitis or whether it's um, some other pathology, we could use ultrasound as a, as a first line management. Um, but as I said, it can be just based on our clinical uh, reasoning. The CT is another test that we do use for appendicitis and the picture on um, my right, your left probably, um, does show a CT um, showing an appendicitis. So it shows an, um, an enlarged appendix. Um, it's marked in here by letter A um, with thickened walls and quite significant amount of edema around it. Um, the issue of the CT is that it does involve ionizing radiation. Um, so it might not be the best choice in females and it might not be the best choice in, um, in children. So depending on the center, um, on the hospital that you work at, um, sometimes it is used quite commonly, but because of, um, because of it involving ionizing radiation and those being able to diagnose appendicitis based on clinical symptoms, um, it's not necessary in, in diagnosis. So for Rosie, we decided to go for the ultrasound. And it's, uh, you can see it on, again, the right hand side for me. Um, and then the ultrasound shows no signs suggestive of gynecological pathology, but the appendix is non-compressible and it does have a diameter of eight millimeters so anything above six millimeters is suggestive of inflammation um, and appendicitis. The walls are thickened, which again is a, um, is a sign of appendicitis. And there is some free fluid in right leg fossa. And as I did say with appendicitis, we do have this obstruction and then increased pressure, but all the secretions are um, continue to be, to be secreted. Um, so some of these fluids will seep out. Um, and again, that's another sign of um, inflammation in, of the appendix. But on the ultrasound, there are no signs of appendiceal perforation and abscesses. So some of the complications um, that we have to suspect, especially if it's a delayed presentation, um, which is quite common in children because the symptoms are quite nonspecific in children, in pregnant ladies, and in elderly people. Um, so they are, um, they are at risk of developing complications before we realize there is appendicitis. Um, so the, the complication that you can see in here um, is the gangrenous appendix. Um, some other complications include append appendiceal abscesses, perforation, and sepsis. All right. So just to summarize this section, um, the key assessment points when we are examining a patient with abdominal pain and who are unwell is we have to um, we have to be able to elicit what type of pain the patient is suffering from because in appendicitis, it's um, as I did say, you do have this classical pain of that starts in the center and then moves to the right-hand side. It might not always be the case, but it's also always important to ask the patient about the timeline of the pain. So how the pain has changed from when, when it started and what type of, um, of pain they're feeling. The associated symptoms are very important. And in appendicitis, it's mostly nausea, vomiting, and anorexia, so not being able to eat. 
We then um, move on to the examination. And in appendicitis, we always have to do the abdominal examination. Um, we have to do external genitalia examination, especially in males. Um, if the patient is unwell, we always have to do our ATE assessment. Um, and then there are some specific signs that we can elicit, as I mentioned before. So some of those are the obturator sign, the star sign, Rovsing signs, and McBurney sign. Um, then we move on to doing some blood, bedside investigations, and imaging. And that should help us um, make our diagnosis. All right. So for all patients with um, that we're suspecting appendicitis in, um, or all patients in with abdominal pain who complain of vomiting, they're unable to eat, and especially in this case where the the blood pressure is slightly low and the heart rate is um, raised, we are going to start with um, intravenous fluids. So we're going to give boluses of fluid if um, the patient requires fluid resuscitation, um, so if they're unstable hemodynamically, um, or if they're stable but vomiting, unable to eat, we're going to, um, to give them a maintenance IV fluids. Um, we're going to give them antiemetics because it's really important for the patient who's in a lot of pain to keep them comfortable. So we're going to try to stop them from, from vomiting and from being nauseous. We're going to give them good analgesia using the WHO ladder, which we have talked about during the first session. Um, we're going to give them some antibiotics um, if we are quite confident um, based on the bloods, um, especially raised white cells and raised CRP, that there is um, an inflammatory um, infection process going on. And we're going to keep the patient to meal by mouth um, because they might need a surgery and um, for the patient to be able to go to surgery, they have to not eat anything for at least six hours and not drink anything for two hours. So it's quite important, especially if the patient might need the surgery soon. But as you'd find in appendicitis, the patients are not very hungry. So they might not want to eat um, anyway. So the management options. Um, we have started with, um, with all of those. So we have given the patient some fluids, um, we have given them some analgesia, antiemetics that, that made our patient feel a bit better. We have started antibiotics and um, you have started them based on the local guidelines because that would differ from the hospital to hospital. And then other options are either conservative management, so we're not operating or surgical management. So for appendicitis, um, the laparoscopic appendicectomy is currently gold standard treatment. Um, so it's a keyhole surgery um, with, um, with very low mortality and morbidity rates. Um, it's a very common surgery. There are about 50,000 um, laparoscopic appendicectomies in the UK um, every year. And um, a recent Cochrane analysis has found that um, laparoscopic appendicectomy should in fact remain gold standard because Antibiotics, even um, if given for a simple appendicitis, appendicitis um, antibiotics alone have a failure rate of 30% in one year. So if we were to treat all the patients with simple appendicitis, just with fluid, antiemetics and antibiotics, 30% of them would need, um, would need um, appendicectomy um, within one year anyway. So it's quite an important thing to warn the patient about. Um, when we're trying to decide between um, antibiotics only or antibiotics and laparoscopic appendicectomy in simple appendicitis. Um, if we are dealing with a patient who's um, severely unwell, hemodynamically unstable, and um, they have complicated um, appendicitis, so if they have a gangrenous appendix or a perforated appendix, they need the surgery straight away. All right, so we give them preoperative antibiotics, but we're going to um, move on to the surgery straight away. And some complications of the surgery, as I did say, the, the morbidity rates are very low, but the patients might get postoperative bleeding and a surgical site infection. So the non-surgical management um, can be attempted in some cases, 
Um, so some of, in some instances, um, so for example, in a patient who is hemodynamically stable, um, for the patient who presents overnight, um, we're not worried about them. Um, they can wait, their, their surgery can be delayed by 12, let's say 12 to 24 hours. And we are going to use the severity of their systemic inflammatory response um, as, a, as a guide to time when we should operate on the patient. Um, in patients who present with appendix masses, so appendix mass is um, a result of the omentum and a small bowel sticking to the appendix. Um, if they're stable, um, we might give them antibiotics and delay the surgery by six to eight weeks. And in children with intraperitoneal abscesses, they might need a drainage before the percutaneous drainage before we consider um, consider surgery. So in Rose's case, um, you can message in the in the chat box. Do you think we should operate on her straight away, or should we go for a non-surgical management? Can just um, answer nay. So as I did say, she presents. Well, I didn't actually say the time of the day. She presents during the day, but she is um, hypertensive, and her blood pressure is slightly low. She has a low grade fever. She complains of nausea and vomiting. Right, I feel like there are lots of um, lots of budding surgeons there. Everyone wants to operate. All right, so we have one non-surgical. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. So we've um, yeah, majority the vast majority of you are right. So for Rosie. Because she presents with um, with hemodynamical instability, we are going to uh, stabilize her first. So we're going to give her IV fluid bolusis and then going to give her maintenance fluids. And we are going to progress the surgery straight away because she is hemodynamically unstable. Um, we're fairly confident that she does have appendicitis. We did an ultrasound which confirmed it is appendicitis. Um, and because of the hemodynamical instability, we're going to progress the surgery straight away. All right, so the treatment that we gave her, just to, um, just to recap, is going to involve IV fluids with resuscitation fluids, so doses of 500 millilitres of, for example, sodium chloride, followed by maintenance fluids. We're going to give her antiemetics. We're going to give her some good analgesia to keep her comfortable. We're going to start antibiotics before the surgery. And we're going to treat her with same day laparoscopic appendicectomy. All right. And you can see how appendix looks in, in real life on this side. So you have the cecum and then appendix, and that's the view from behind. All right. So before we before we move on to the questions that you might have, I just wanted to ask a few questions myself. So we're going to have three or four questions and then we're going to move on to um, a short Q&A to answer any questions that you might have. So the first question is, um, in patients who have shoulder tip pain following peritoneal perforation, um, where do you think which structure has been um, irritated? Um, you can just answer with a letter um, in, in the chat box. So the patient is complaining of um, shoulder pain, um, where do we think the peritoneal perforation um, has gone to and irritated an organ? So is it a diaphragm, is it vagus nerve, ureter, or intercostal muscles? Let's have a quick look. Guys, it's smashing it. Yeah, so the answer, um, the answer is going to be A because of the referred pain. Um, so the, the phrenic nerve originates from um, C3 to C5, 
and it then travels down in, in your vasodiaphragm. diaphragm. So if there is a peritoneal perforation, which irritates the diaphragm, that will cause referred pain to usually your shoulder tip, unilaterally or on both sides. So that's quite important if um, that's another sign um, that we can use to decide if it's um, simple or complicated appendicitis. If the patient is complaining of shoulder tip pain, there most likely is a perforation that's irritating the diaphragm. Where is the McBurney's point? So you have four answers. And again, just post the, the answer in the chat. Have a look. Oh. Yeah, fantastic. Right, so the Mark Bernie's point is in fact located two thirds of the way between the umbilicus and the aces. And it's important to know where it is because this is where the pain and appendicitis were localized to. Right, moving on to the next question. Um, which of the following describes a SOAS sign? I think that'll be my last question and then we can move on to your questions. And let's have a look what you think. Okay, I'll give you one more minute. Fantastic. All right. So the answer is B, because the SAR sign um, is elicited when we extend the, the right hip, because that will stretch the SAR's major muscle. And if there is an inflammation um, and loads of infection um, in the appendix, which is very close to the SAR's major, that will elicit pain when we extend the hip. Right. So just to summarize what we spoke about today, um, appendicitis is one of the most common um, surgical emergencies. So if you're working on a surgical ward, most likely you're going to see many, many patients with um, appendicitis coming through the doors. The presentation, um, one of the most common symptoms um, are described as a Murphy's triad. So that's nausea and vomiting, low grade fever and right iliac fossa pain. But we do know that the pain classically starts in the umbilicus and then moves to right iliac fossa pain. We always have to remember to do pregnancy tests in females of childbearing age. We always have to examine external genitalia in males because we are worried about testicular torsion and epididymitis. Um, appendicitis remains mostly a clinical diagnosis, uh, but there are some adjuncts that we can use. So there are some blood tests that can help us make a diagnosis. We can use ultrasound um, and in some cases we can use a CT. Um, the management, so as a junior doctor, um, when you're suspecting the um, suspecting appendicitis, it's really important to remember that we need to stabilize the patient uh, based on our A to E assessment. We have to give them maintenance fluids and keep them nearby by mouth. We have to give them antiemetics and analgesia to keep them comfortable. All of those things sound like very simple, um, simple things to do, but it does make a lot of difference for a patient um, when they're coming in with the uh, with severe pain and they're severely unwell. If we make can make their symptoms a bit better, it does improve their their experience um, and it just improves their their well being. So it's really important to remember about that. And this is something that you, as a junior doctor, um, are more than capable of doing. Um, and as a rule of thumb, if the patient's unstable, they need urgent surgery. And in some cases that we talk about, the surgery can be delayed. 
Great. So I just wanted to remind everyone that those free surgical webinars are, um, are held weekly. Um, so please join us for, for the sessions in the future. And please visit Mind the Bleep website. Um, so it's mindthebleep.com forward slash surgery um, to access um, articles um, on all the sessions and all the other articles. Um, so for this session, uh, the article is going to be uploaded very shortly and you can just um, use it to, to recap everything that we spoke about. Um, and you can use it as a cheat sheet when you are actually seeing patients on a surgical take um, to know what, what to do and how to assess the patient. Um, and if, you, um, if you'd like to join us next week, this session is going to be on surgical causes of jaundice. Um, this session is recorded. Let me just move myself up. Um, this session is recorded, um, but if you want to access the recording and the written content, and um, if you want to, to learn more from us, uh, we'd like you to fill in the feedback form um, just by scanning this QR code. And that's going to give you access to all the recorded material. But more importantly, it's going to give us loads of tips on what we can do to improve the sessions, to make sure that, um, that you get all the information that you need to be, to be a better doctor and feel more confident. Um, and if you do fill in the, the feedback, you're going to get a certificate um, for attendance, which is useful for your portfolios. Um, so I'm just going to, if you, um, for the next couple of minutes, post any questions that you might have in the chat box, I'm going to answer them in a second. If you don't feel like asking questions now, you can always um, just contact us at um, webinars at mindableep.com. So what I need you to do now, if you have any questions, post them in the chat box. And please, please scan the QR code um, to fill in the feedback form. So I'll leave the feedback form um, for you to scan just to make sure everyone has access to it. And then I'll give you a couple of minutes and then we move on to um, answering any questions you might have. Oh, you'd like the link to the feedback form. Give me one second. Um, yeah, just keep the questions coming and I'm going to answer them in just one second. I will sort out the link for the feedback for you. Let me just post the link. Give me just one second. Um, apologies. All right, so here's the link for the feedback please please fill it in because it's really very important for us right. okay so please fill in the feedback form and now going through the questions um the first one is can appendectomy be done with a pregnant woman I think it's a very, very good question and very um, technically difficult. 
So it can be done in a pregnant woman, um, but it's not done laparoscopically. It has to be done via an open incision. And the care has to be taken to not breach the, the womb barrier. Um, but actually reading through, through the literature, the appendicitis in general in pregnancy is, um, seems to be less common than in a general population and the risk is lowest in the third um, trimester. Um, but if we are doing appendicectomy on the pregnant lady, it does have to be by an open incision. All right, so the next question is, when is the best time to give the antibiotics for appendicitis? Um, so somebody here suggested 30 minutes prior to surgery an hour uh, or once the diagnosis has been established. So um, I think the simplest answer is once the diagnosis has been established, because there might be some delay um, with going to surgery um, because of loads, of loads of reasons, including just ordering the, the theater slot and, and et cetera, or the patient might have had some water and that we have to wait for longer. So I think the easiest thing to do as a junior doctor is to start antibiotics as soon as um, you have consulted your findings with a senior um, and you do think it's appendicitis and the patient's blood suggests that uh, it's appendicitis and there is an infection going on, um, then starting the antibiotics as soon as a diagnosis has been established is, is a good starting point for you. Um, can we proceed with appendicectomy in appendicular abscess? So it depends on the patient's state. Um, so if the patient is, um, is very unwell, um, then it doesn't matter if they do have an abscess or, or not, we have to proceed straight to surgery. If the patient is stable, um, sometimes we can try to, um, try to manage with antibiotics first, but actually the abscess might be the the call, might be the result of um, appendix perf uh, append appendiceal perforation. So in that case, we have to we have to do it straight away. So if it's a um, abscess caused by perforation, we do the surgery straight away. Um, if it's an appendix mass, then we can delay the surgery. Um, and yeah, if the patient is stable with the with the abscess and it's not caused by perforation then we can um, try conservative management as well. Do you guys have any other questions? As I did say, if you have any questions at any point, you can always contact us. Um, should I give you one more minute? Please make sure you fill in the feedback form. Um, and if there are no other questions, um, all right, so is it okay to give pain relief if we're considering the patient suffering from, is AP appendicitis in this question? I think it's always, always a good idea to give patient a pain relief. If the patient's in pain, we have to, we have to make them feel more comfortable. Um, what antibiotics would you give to this patient? Well, that depends on the, usually depends on the trust that you work at. Um, when you do a surgical job, everyone uh, kind of has their, their favorite antiemetic. So some of the antiemetics that um, you can give is cyclozine or ondansetrone, um, metoclopramide. So all of those are, are good first line options. Um, and depending on how the patient is feeling, you can give them um, orally or IV. Um, with morphine, um, alluring to, so the, the last question is, um, should we avoid morphine? Um, we should use that WHO ladder to manage the pain. So we wouldn't start with, um, with uh, morphine. I don't think that based on any literature, there is a one single best um, pain medication for appendicitis, um, but we should use the WHO ladder. So try simple analgesia like paracetamol, and then try to move on, move up the ladder if, if it's not working. Um, I certainly would not start with, uh, with morphine straight away because that's, that's at the top of your, of your ladder and you have loads of other options before. I hope that answers all the questions we have.
at the moment? Um, the antibiotics. Um, we follow TRAS guidelines um, for antibiotics. So when you start working in the hospital, every trust um, has their own um, trust guidelines. So for example, in the trust that I used to work at, we would give patients carmoxiclav, but that's not a hard and fast rule. Um, and that will depend on the, on the trust that you're working at. So it's always very important when you start working somewhere to, to look on, on the intranet or um, there are always um, usually apps that you can use, um, which have uh, trust guidelines on it. Um, and it will have specific guidance for specific disease, so like a micro guide or RX guidelines, but that again will differ from trust to trust. All right. Um, thank you very much, guys, for, for your time. I hope that was useful and I hope that will make you feel a bit more comfortable when you have to deal with, um, with a patient who has appendicitis yourself. Um, and if you, if you can, if you do work in a hospital, um, it's really cool to go and see the surgery because that helps you, um, helps you understand the disease a bit better and then helps you to anticipate what a complication the patients might have. Um, oh no, not able to fill in the feedback form. Let me repost. It's really important. Um, right. So if the QR code didn't work, there is a there is a link again. So I'm going to leave you to it, and the link is going to be available when I stop the stop the session. So I hope everyone has a lovely evening, and we'll see you next week for the session on jaundice.